This paper is concerned with the conceptual approach to decision making about the selection of technology to support e-learning of Generation Y. The paper adopts a holistic approach using activity theory whilst addressing some common assumptions about Generation Y, their relationship with technology and proposed preference for e-learning. Based on the work of the Russian psychologist Vygotsky and his colleagues Luria and Leontev, activity theory is based on a socio-cultural perspective. There are three generations in the development of activity theory. It is the second generation activity that is central to the analysis conducted in this paper. Second generation activity theory assumes that learning is a community endeavour. The subject, learner, achieves the object, learning, mediated in an environment that incorporates a range of explicit and implicit tools. Outcomes differs from ob the object of learning in that it asks what is the purpose of the learning. Here the question goes to the heart of discussions about the purpose of education. Rules include those policies, regulations and conventions that must be adopted within the activity system. More implicit rules include the conventions that reflect this is the way we do things around here. Community represents key actors or stakeholders within the environment in which the activity takes place. Division of labour reflects the way in which the responsibilities are divided and who is responsible for what. First, let's consider the desired object and outcome of the activity system under consideration. Given the topic, the object of the activity system is the integration and increased use of e-learning technology into education. However, the desired outcome is more problematic and goes to a central question about the purpose of education. This purpose will be associated with cognitive and skill development, social development and cultural development. The balance of these outcomes is likely to be context specific, varying from country to country depending on the cultural and historical inheritance and the stage of economic development. Therefore, the desired outcome can only be determined through a process of negotiation between the key stakeholders in the education system. This brings us to the category of subjects, that is, who is involved. By definition, each generational group is united by a common set of formative experiences. In the case of Generation Y, this common experience revolves around the emergence of the computer chip and the internet. It's generally considered that Gen Y were born between 1982 and 2000. They are currently between 8 and 20 years of age. This means that Gen Y are currently represented in primary, secondary and tertiary sectors of education. One argument commonly used by those who are particularly passionate about the characteristics of Generation Y and the need for what are often described as wholesale changes to education is the proposal that experiencing generational change is a unique event and that education is in crisis. Such a claim simply ignores the past. For example, in 1922 the great American inventor Thomas Edison is attributed as saying that the motion picture is destined to revolutionise our educational system. In 1968 the British psychologist B.F. Skinner went further than Edison in in 1984, Capote is attributed as also foreshadowing the demise of schools. It may be true that the speed of qu and quantum of generational difference is greater now than it has been in the past. However, it's also reasonable to suggest that as the quantum and speed of generational change has increased, so has the ability of each generation to accept and manage change. Therefore, the experience is not the same from one generation to the next. Another argument often used is that technology is crucial to everything that students learn. In response I'd suggest that historically technology has always been central to schooling and what students learn, whether this involves the technologies of chalk and board, nib and ink, pen and paper or computer. Technologies of their time are embedded into the activity system in which we find ourselves. They are available to us and influence the normative behaviours of the time. Education should always explore the appropriate application of technology in teaching and learning. However, in activity theory terms, the objective and desired outcomes must be central to pedagogic decisions about what constitutes appropriate use of technology. Mark Prinsky, who coined the term digital natives, 
has asserted that students are clamouring for these technologies to be used as part of their education. But how correct is the assertion that students want to use technology to learn and which technologies are we talking about? In the USA, a survey of 4,373 college students, of whom 95% had been born in 1989 or after, concluded that we expected to find that the net generation students would demand greater use of technology in teaching and learning. What we found was a moderate preference for technology. A more recent survey of 850 undergraduates in three introductory level core courses in Australia found that 73.3% of respondents prefer to have a choice between web-based and print materials and that only 36.8% of respondents preferred a course that only had online or web materials. A survey of more than 2,000 incoming first-year Australian university students in 2006 also finds that there is a high level of support for the use of computers, the web and mobile technologies for some uses but not for others. The researchers conclude that while some students have embraced the technologies and tools of the net generation, this is by no means the universal student experience. However, the findings of this study are a cause for optimism amongst the supporters of using technology. No more than 25% of respondents disagreed with the use of any specific technology to assist with studies, and in all cases more respondents indicated that they are unsure about the use of a technology than those who indicated a resistance to use. In a general sense, it would seem that students are looking for a moderate integration of technology into their learning, and it would appear that, given the choice and opportunity, they see face-to-face -face experiences as important. These preferences may be best met through the use of blended learning. These findings support a recent article that describes claims that Gen Y are disappointed, dissatisfied and disengaged from existing educational systems and approaches and calls for major change in education as moral panic. Claims that have been subjected to little scrutiny and under-theorised and lack a sound empirical basis. In activity theory, the category of tools includes physical artefacts, the skills that the subjects bring to the activity, and the symbols and myths that are operationalised within the activity. Here I will focus on the tools that students bring to the activity system and will discuss these issues by addressing some further assumptions that are used to underpin the promotion of e-learning. Firstly, that the learning styles and preferences of Gen Y are different from previous generations. Secondly, that Gen Y have access to the technologies that are required to support e-learning. Thirdly, that Gen Y have the technical skills to support learning. And finally, that Gen Y have the metacognitive skills or learning to learn skills that are required to support e-learning. Advocates of the use of e-learning technology such as Prensky assert that today's students think and process information fundamentally differently from their predecessors. Such claims lack any strong empirical base and have been largely founded on a thin body of evidence, so says Bennett et al. 2008. The observation that Gen Y are primary visual and kinesthetic learners prefer immediacy and multitasking, collaboration and experiential learning about things that matter are representative of reports about Generation Y. One wonders if previous generations who have been subjected to the experiences of learning in a mass education system characterised by a teacher-centred approach would also have preferred teaching approaches with these characteristics. What evidence does exist seems to contradict universal claims about the nature of Gen Y as a justification for wholesale changes in the education system. Using the Solomon and Felder learning system inventory and interviews, Damani compared the learning styles of baby boomers Gen X and Gen Y employees in a banking environment. He found that there were no large differences in learning style preferences across the generations. The similarities outweighed the differences and that differences are too minor to be of any practical benefit in the design of training. Even if Gen Y do have preferred learning styles that are different to previous generations, it is not necessarily the case that they will prefer different delivery approaches from the past.